Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer, and this is my Christmas special. I'm telling the story, a story by Philip Mercer, who wrote this remarkable book, Tales of Old Sussex, in 1834. He collected these stories from his parishioners. He worked as a curate, and uh, he kept them and put them together, compiled them into this into this remarkable book, which I don't think is in print anymore, and uh, very few people seem to have a copy of it. Anyway, I've been looking in there for a, a particularly festive one. Uh, his stories are sort of dark and macabre and a bit weird, so I have found one and I hope that you like it. It's called The Christmas Box, and it concerns the story of a Jonathan Carrington. He lived on an estate in an old manor house in Rudgwick. He was not really a lord, but he was sort of like a lord of the manor type character, it seems. He had a, a business to do with shipping down in Portsmouth and Southampton, and he'd made a, a fair bit of money and, and had retired. And at 76, unfortunately, he had died of consumption. And it uh, was sad because it was a week or so before Christmas that year. The story takes place in the early 1700s. So at Christmas time there'd been the funeral and the family and the friends had gathered around uh, at Christmas to celebrate not only the life of John Carrington but of course uh, Christ the Lord. And as was normal in these large manor houses on Christmas Day, they, uh, they got up early, they went for a walk, they looked at the estate and then they would have a, a lovely Christmas meal. And after the meal, the family and the friends who were gathered around in the big hall of the house would enjoy the presents that many had given. And the presents, as was typical, were all coloured in lovely wrapping paper with ribbons and placed around a Christmas tree. And the family would sit back in the chairs and one of them would hand out all these presents to whomever they were written. And it seemed that that was the order of the day until everybody rejoicing at their little gifts and pleasantries and things were finished. Except there was one more parcel that was, was left there, although it wasn't really a parcel, it was more of a, a small wooden box wrapped up in string, very different from the rest of the parcels. It had no label on it, so there was no recipient and no sender, and nobody seemed to know whom had put it there, where it had come from. Well, it sat there for some time with people wondering, well, who's going to open it? Who's it for? And as nobody claimed it, it was eventually decided that it would be opened and everybody would see what it was. And so the string was taken apart and the lid was removed and the interior object was taken out. It was a skull, a human skull. Well, this horrified the gathered family and friends as they looked at this thing. It was clearly a, a, an old skull, not anything, anybody who had died recently. Um, and it uh, had no flesh, of course. It was just the, the bone of the skull. Uh, and at first it was thought, well, this was a practical joke, especially so soon after John Carrington's death. Who could possibly have placed it there? But no one would own up. No one would say it was them. So the staff were questioned if they knew anything about it. It had put a, a, a real sombre and rather nasty um, thing on the, on, the, on the gathering. But nobody would own up at all as to who had put it there. Then somebody suggested, perhaps the skull had got there by mistake. Perhaps the workman who had been renovating earlier that year on the old water tower, which was built around 1600s, had found something and put it in a box and somehow by mistake had, it had ended up underneath the Christmas tree and the, the, the member of a servant or a member of the family just was too embarrassed to own up that it was them and that this skull possibly had been found in, I don't know, one of the, the walls, a cavity in the wall of the old water tower. It was possible. 
So with this in mind, after Christmas, the workmen were asked about this. Had anything been found? There was a peculiarity about this skull which had struck everybody at the Christmas gathering. For above the left eye socket on the temple was a deformity, a sort of depression. It was very unusual, this depression, and was the first thing you noticed, really, about the skull. It suggested that somebody had been bashed on the head. It was known, for example, that during the English Civil War, around 1634, that the Cavaliers had camped, with the landowner's then permission, on the grounds of the estate as part of the English Civil War before they moved off. Had something happened to one of the men folk? Had uh, they fallen from the tower or had there been a fight and one of them bashed on the head? Had their body been secretly uh, dismembered and, and hidden and with the, the skull in the water tower? But the workmen were confused by all of this for they had found nothing unusual or untoward. And it was deemed that this skull had not originated from there. Where had it come from? Nobody seemed to know. In time, though, this skull became rather that of a talking point. As people would visit the house, the skull would reside on a shelf. And people would say, golly, you have a skull there. Where is it from? And the mystery would be talked about. It was said that if you held the skull close to your chest, a cold chill would go down your spine. But it was never felt that this skull brought bad luck or was an ill omen. In fact, very little mishaps ever happened to the family. There was neither good fortune or bad fortune that could at least be associated with the skull. And so the skull became part of one of those objects you talk about that made up one of the many different objects in the hallway, in the great hall. But in time, the skull, everybody had got to know the story and people were no longer interested in the skull. And so it was moved from a prominent place to a less prominent place. It was replaced in its box and, and then eventually it was placed somewhere and put in a cupboard. And, and after a while, who knew where it was? It had become lost. Yet despite that, there seemed to be one individual in the household who had a mischievous interest in this skull. For the following Christmas, just as before, presents had been placed around the Christmas tree and the presents dished out after the great meal and the people were rejoicing, the box would reappear amongst the presents, placed there once again. Well, this was uh, a bit more than a, a practical joke. This was somewhat intolerable. Who would place the box there with the skull inside a second time? This was not the done thing at all. This happened for several years. Christmas would come and the mysterious box would just appear, as it were, amongst all the other presents. It was very irritating, but it became a little expected. Somebody somewhere was, co was continuing this joke of finding the box and, and putting it there. But in time, the, uh, the then owner of the house himself passed away and the house passed down once more to the heir, the eldest son. And the eldest son's wife didn't like this skull. In fact, she hated it. It disturbed her greatly. She didn't like the story. She didn't like it appearing at Christmas time. And she certainly didn't want it amongst all the gifts. So she decided that she would get rid of this skull. And at first she got in touch with dealers and collectors and said, this is the story of the skull. Would it fetch anything? Could I make some money from it? It has this heritage, this ghostly reappearance, if you like. But dealers and collectors were not interested. So she offered it to medical institutions to see if they wanted to take it for their students. But they didn't. It even ended up in the village fete that took place on the estate's land once a year. And among all the bric-a-brac and strange, quirky things that people would donate and that were sold, 
the one thing that didn't sell was the box with the skull in it. This was intolerable. So the lady of the house then decided she would get hold of the most burly stable boy and get him to get it rid of it. I want it destroyed, she said. Destroy it and bury it in the furthest field on the estate. And don't tell me where it is. I do not want to know. I, no one else will know where it is. But just get rid of it. Yes, ma'am, he said. And it was done. Now she could relax. For the remainder of the year, the last five or six months or so, she felt that she had achieved something. It was over. The story of the skull had come to an end. Christmas came once again, as it does. And as it did so, the lady of the house grew somewhat concerned. Would this box reappear? She'd had it destroyed, it had been buried, and no one had ever spoken about it, and whilst it had never brought misfortune, she didn't want it to appear again. The matter was closed. And as was usual, friends and family would turn up a few days before Christmas and then would leave a few days after the new year, bringing with them gifts and presents which would be placed around the Christmas tree, the lady of the house began to be nervous and she would look among the presents that were being placed there to make sure that the box with the skull was not among them. It was not. But she would look first thing in the morning and last thing at night until the great day came. And then with some trepidation after the big meal, she scanned amongst all the presents. Still no sign of this box. And the presents were handed out to each and every member of the large extended family. And there was no box with the skull. She was relieved. She could finally relax. And the family retired drinking brandy and coffee and reading the newspapers while the children were playing with some of their new toys. And then the semi-silence, the murmuring of voices, was broken by a shriek and a cry from a toddler who had been playing with a wooden hoop and a corn dolly. The heads turned round. What could possibly be the matter? This toddler, who was three or four, was holding the skull in front of it and looking at it with a grimmest face. This was too much for the lady of the house, for she fainted. The then owner of the house, who was him de himself a descended Carrington, as I had explained, he thought this too much. He demanded who had placed this here? How had it got here? Where had it come from? But nobody knew. He lined up the servants. Where had this skull come from? They denied knowing anything of it. Somebody knows, he said. Then he remembered the stable boy that had smashed it up and buried it. He rushed out into the stable. He, he saddled up his own horse and rode into Rudgwick, where he found the house of the stable boy and in front of the boy's own family on Christmas evening. He demanded why this child, why this boy, who was in his early teens, had not smashed the, the skull as had been directed and had kept it and possibly placed it under the tree. The boy went to pieces, denying that he had done and carried out his lady's wishes. He said he had trouble breaking the, the skull. It, it would not break. No matter how hard he swung the axe, it would not smash the skull. In fact, he thought it odd because not only would it not smash it, it did not chip it. It did not make a mark on it. Apart from the horrible dent dentedness that was already in there above the eye and the temple that already was with us, but there was no blemishes at all. So instead, he decided that he would have to bury it whole, and he did in the furthest field from the house. He had told no one, he told the landlord. I have told no one where it was, and I did not place it under the tree. The landowner had to accept this, though he was not happy at all. The following day on Boxing Day, still in a foul mood, it was suggested to the landowner that perhaps this skull ought to be placed in the family vault.
perhaps he was a, a, a member of the family that had somehow become unearthed and in some weird ghostly fashion was appearing and, and needed to be laid to rest. Well, they'd tried everything else to get rid of this flaming skull and maybe that would work. Another suggested that perhaps this skull uh, was in fact John Carrington's skull, although that was readily dismissed because John Carrington's had died on the same Christmas that this skull had started to appear and the skull was clearly uh, not covered in flesh and had no time to within the three or four days since his death. And it would be an easy thing to check this out by exhuming the original grave of the, of the original John Carrington and see. And so this was carried out. The skull was taken to the mausoleum, the original coffin that John Carrington lay in was opened and his skeleton lay intact in there, complete with his own skull. And so this skull, the one that kept appearing with the strange deform deformation de or deforming in it, was placed on top of the coffin and the mausoleum sealed up once more. And that was that. Well, Christmas came. And with Christmas, more parcels, more family. But no mysterious box and no skull. The landlord and the lady of the house seemed to be relieved. This hadn't happened. There was no mention of it. Nobody spoke of it. There was no skull to appear. The following Christmas came and the same was true and the following one after that and many subsequent Christmases came and went and there was no skull. This had sealed it. There was rejoicing, if you like, and everyone was happy. The skull never made an appearance again. And that was the story, except there is a postscript to this story. For remember the toddler who cried when he held the skull in his hands. That toddler grew up. He went to university. He studied history and geology and archaeology. He went on to work at the British Museum. And it was while he was working at the British Museum that he'd heard that the old house, because of death duties and death in the family, was going to be sold. In fact, it was going to be auctioned and parts of the land were to be parceled up and sold separately. And because he was a cousin of the family, he thought, and, and had an interest in it, he thought he would go to the auction to see what the house and some of its contents would fetch. So he came down from London and stayed over and there, in numerous boxes, as well as the house, were many of the, the, the contents, the valuables, the paintings, and various different collections of things that were to be sold off. There was a, a box of mis miscellaneous objects, which really would have no value to anyone. Uh, a leather-bound volume, for example, from the, the housekeeper that kept the note of everything that had ever been bought and sold. And just as at, out of interest, he picked this up and flicked through the pages, looking at how much certain uh, elements in the garden would have cost or uh, restoration work for the, the tower or uh, the roof being fixed or, or, or even bits and pieces for the food. It was all in this ledger. And then a sheet of paper fell from that as he was flicking through it, buried somewhere within the ledger. It slipped to the floor and he picked it up to return it, casually glancing at it as you would. And he was somewhat taken aback. He, he took a further interest in this, for it seemed to be a note, not quite a birth certificate, but very similar, like a, a register of birth. For it had the register of a John Carrington, the John Carrington, who had died right early, the, the shipping tycoon. But also a brother, a twin brother, Robert. Now this 
was intriguing. There had been no mention in the family of this other, younger brother. Who was he? Nobody seemed to know. It seemed impossible that there had been a brother. It, it, and also impossible that if there had been a brother, why did nobody know about it? Yet this little sheet of paper, which seemed to register that there was a brother, was the only evidence in sight. Well, being a historian, this story now intrigued him. And he dug further, and over the months he uncovered in another batch of papers and uh, belongings, that the nanny had written letters. The nanny that had looked after John and Robert when they were children, all those years ago in the early 1700s. And there was one letter in particular where she mentions the boys. This was incredible. He read the letter and it seemed that within the letter she was she, it was never posted, this letter, for it was still sealed when he found it. But in the letter, it seemed to suggest, very much so, that the boys squabbled. They hated one another. And so much so that Robert, the younger brother, had said very many times that when John grew up, he would kill him. So you can see how the historian was fascinated by this and wanted to get to the bottom of it and he began to dig further. In fact, he came across some papers which suggested that Robert and John lived together and that John had inherited the house when the parents had died young and they couldn't get on and so Robert had left and had gone overseas never to return. Now, that the historian thought was lucky, so that at least John could then live his long life and uh, get to 76 and, and unfortunately die of consumption. But this became questioned when, nearly a year later, turning up in a different archive altogether, was the family doctor's diary from that period. And within the diary, there was a call out, a call out to the time when the two brothers were living and just the servants. Apparently, one of the twins had been bashed on the head, had caused concussion and had a terrible deformity in his skull. This skull that was buried in the mausoleum had to be Robert. And yet there was a strange anomaly there, for the doctor must have got the twins mixed up, for he clearly writes that it was Robert who attacked John, that it was John that suffered the um, concussion and the anomaly, the indentation in the head above the eye on the temple, that it was John who later potentially had the, the chance of brain damage and could possibly have died. That was the doctor's opinion. If John had died, it would have been Robert that survived. Robert, the younger son, who hadn't inherited the house. But they lived alone in the house. Robert is said to have disappeared overseas. What if the doctor hadn't got the names the wrong way round. What if Robert had attacked John, thought the historian, and that John had died, and that in fact the skull was John, and Robert took John's place and built up the business, and disposed of John, and left the skull? Was that what had happened? Who knows? But the skull had made its reappearance until finally it was in its resting place in the mausoleum in the garden of the old manor house. It's a fascinating story. I don't know what you make of it. Philip Mercer leaves us sometimes in suspense. But I've enjoyed telling it and I hope you've enjoyed listening. I hope you have a Merry Christmas if you're watching this on Christmas Day or over the Christmas period. And I will see you again when I'm out and about doing my thing. Until next time, bye-bye, bye-bye.